Open your Bible this morning with me to Mark chapter 3. This morning we continue our study through Mark's gospel as we continue and finish out chapter 3. This morning we're in Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 31 through the end of the chapter in verse 35. This morning's sermon is entitled, After a Hymn That We Sing Every Sunday, The Family of God. Mark chapter 3, this morning, verses 31 through 35. Each Sunday, we close out our service by joining hands together, unless there's a decision that's being made where a life has been changed with the family of God. And it's because I believe, and and I hope that you recognize it too, that as a church body, we are more than just people who sit on pews together. We are more than just people who have come to the same location for church because we've decided this is where we want to spend our Sunday. But we do this because we recognize the bonds within this room. That those bonds ought to be greater than strangers sitting on a pew together. That these bonds, according to the Bible, we're family. That's why you call me Brother Taylor. That's why I call on brother so-and-so to pray or, or, or to speak in our services. This is why we, we use these terminologies together and it's why it's used throughout the Bible is because we're more than just strangers. We're more than just people who are at the same place in the same time. We're family together. And this morning, as we explore this topic, we're going to see that Jesus, through his examples in his own ministry, recognized this very truth about the family bonds of the blood of Jesus. This morning, stand with me in the honor of reading God's word as we look at Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 31. Hear now the words of the living and true God. Then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold! Your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that though we are all very different and come from different backgrounds and from different families, That this morning, by the blood of Jesus Christ, which has been shed for us, we have been grafted in as Gentiles into your precious kingdom by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it is on this account that we can boldly proclaim that we are family together, even with our brother, the Son of God himself, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for what you've done through him. And this morning, as we consider what this does for us as we gather in unity, Lord, I pray that you would call us to seek out and seek after this great love for you and for one another that we find in the family of God. Lord, we thank you for your grace poured out for us. And as we study your word this morning, we pray that your spirit would be here guiding us in it. We thank you and we ask all of these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. From society's perspective, family is everything. Whether or not that's the example that the world sets, they believe that family is everything. That's that's a, a truth that the world would at least agree with, whether or not they would apply that to their actual situation. Oftentimes, it's families who believe this the strongest that have some of the greatest problems. But it all comes from this kind of mindset of this blood is thicker than water, that it is, it is our families, it is our, our blood that is stronger than any other bond that we might have. And no matter how much we don't like those people sometimes, and in so much as we, 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 don't dis- we disagree with those people sometimes who we call family, oftentimes it is this blood, it is family that gets those people in the same room every Thanksgiving and Christmas and at the family reunion in order to do those things. But contrary to what society would say, blood is not the strongest binder together of people. But it is the blood of Jesus that binds different people people who have absolutely nothing in common and who argue sometimes more than family itself together in the name of Jesus, in the church, in the family of God, both here in our local church as around the world as believers in Jesus Christ. 
Could you imagine, church, that there's somebody on the opposite side of the world who believes the same things about Jesus that you do, and if you got together and ate fried chicken on a Sunday with them, I guarantee you, you'd have something in common because you're bonded together in the family of God by the blood of Jesus. And this has some ramifications. For if this blood, this Christ's blood is the one that binds together people of different backgrounds and is stronger than any family tie that we might have, the first thing that we have to deal with in the family of God is, what do we do with the other relationships in our life? Namely, what do we do with actual family? Here Jesus speaks and gives us an example at the very beginning in the question asked to him by those who enter the room. Let's begin our study this morning in verse 31. It sets the scene for what's happening here. Remember, Jesus has gone back home, Mark's gospel says. And as he is back home, we would imagine that this being the place he grew up, he's got some family nearby. And what do you know, but in verse 31, we see some of this very family coming to look for him. And we might glean from the text, make an inference from the text, that because many of the people were not happy with what was happening with Jesus here, that he had come back and he has lost his mind, chapter 3 says, that the people who are local to Jesus did not agree with his teachings, were, were worried as he was amassing these great crowds, we might imagine that maybe his family might think the same thing. We don't know this for certain. We certainly see Mary at the cross. However, we see this here, and as his family comes, maybe embarrassed by all of the press he's getting, and much of it is negative, they look to call Jesus out of the crowds, back home, and to talk to him, talk him into his senses. We don't know this for sure, but it could be. And this might substantiate why Jesus' answer is as it is. But nonetheless, we see here in verse 31, his mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, that is outside of the place where he's preaching, they sent word to him and called him. And I think here, what we see is a Jesus who has gone off who has been baptized, who has began his ministry, who has called his disciples, and he looks very different than his hometown remembered him. A Jesus who we've already noted, his hometown did not like the way that he returned, for he was very different, amassing the crowds, teaching a gospel that proclaimed that salvation is by him alone, that he has the power to forgive sins. We see a Jesus who is not exactly as he once was. And I think here is our first application this morning. For when we come to the family of God, there ought to be a transition from who we used to be into who we now are. That when the people who used to know us and recognize us look upon us, we are unrecognized in the grace of Jesus Christ. That this is something that changes us through and through, even to the point that outside, the world cannot tell who we are anymore. And I think this is the dilemma that we're having here is that they are looking for him and do not know where he might be. That they're looking for him, but they are not amongst the crowds that he is drawing. Here, Jesus is giving us this example of this change that takes place in our life. And many of us, I believe, should be able to look back at who we used to be before we knew Jesus and look at who we now are and we can recognize the tension that that creates in many of our relationships. For who we used to be put us in groups with people who did some unholy and ungodly things. And I bet you, if we were to poll the congregation this morning, we would recognize that when we stopped doing the things of the world and we began to follow after Jesus, we had to lose a lot of friends along the way in repentance and in walking away from former lifestyles, lots of things change. And as a result, Jesus now is going to be asked a question in verse 32 and give an answer in verse 33 that's pretty shocking, but is just along these lines that once we are changed, some things in our life have to change as well. Verse 32, a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. I wonder, is Jesus right in the middle of a sermon right now? <laughs> and somebody raises their hand. They said, hey, Jesus, somebody needs you real quick. If my mama and my brothers walk into the middle of my sermon, I sure hope you don't interrupt me to tell me they're outside because there's more important things. It's the kingdom of God that matters the most. Amen. 
That, that, that's, that's, that's not how it ought to go. And that they're interrupting Jesus in the middle of his sermon. They ought not to have done that. And so Jesus tactfully uses, as he always does, I love how Jesus preaches because he uses illustrations. He uses object lessons. He, 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 he takes the, the thing that they think is going to get him off his game and he uses it as a powerful point. Here they interrupt his sermon. They say, hey, somebody's looking for you. It's your mother and your brothers. And then Jesus stops. In verse 33, answering them, he said, who are my mother and my brothers? What an interesting response. You don't remember them, Jesus? You don't remember these people that you've you've grown up with that I'm sure uh, bickered with little little Jesus, especially that day where he didn't come home from the temple. Uh, This is a person you ought to remember, Jesus. Why would you say such a thing? It illustrates to us something very important about the family of God. That when we change, when we come into the family of God, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have to forget about some of the things of our former life. And here Jesus does this on the greatest of scales. I remember in my conversion, I shared it, I believe, on last Wednesday evening, that there was a time in my life where I was running with a crowd I shouldn't have been running with. And it was a transformative period in my life and in following Jesus because I left some friends behind in order to more faithfully follow Jesus. Many of us have to faithfully follow Jesus by leaving friends behind. Sometimes you might be faced with, you need to leave a job. Because the people who are working there and the ungodly culture that is there is such that you cannot rightly follow Jesus with all the sin that's happening around and that is pulling you into the sin that's going on. You might have to leave friend groups. You might have to leave a multitude of things in order to follow Jesus. But Jesus here gives us the hardest thing to leave behind. He says, who are my mother and my brothers? Jesus sets the example for us that even in the Christian life, in joining the family of God, sometimes we have to leave behind the most difficult of things in order to follow. This morning, you're going to need a Bible. You need to power it on or grab one from your pews, or maybe you brought one with you. Flip with me to the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 9, we have a very similar teaching of Jesus. So if you don't believe me from Mark chapter 3, you'll see the words of Jesus once again at the very end of Luke chapter 9. Jesus calls us and tells us, in order to follow me, you're going to have to leave some things behind. You're going to have to do a very difficult thing, and you're not only going to have to leave behind friends and colleagues and co-workers, you're going to have to leave behind loved ones as well. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 57. Luke 9, 57. The setting comes in verse 57. Luke 9, 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Here's a person who wants to follow Jesus. Luke 9, 57 gives us somebody who is petitioning for membership in the church, who is petitioning the Lord and saying, I want to follow you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. And this is what Jesus says to them. Luke 9, 58, and Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. What is he saying? You might have to be uncomfortable to follow Jesus. You might have to leave behind your bed. You might have to leave behind your food. You might have to leave behind the comforts of this world if you're going to follow Jesus. Luke 9, 59, and another, he says to them, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. Seems reasonable. There's been a death in the family. He needs to bury his father. He needs to have the funeral. We would expect Jesus to say, let me preach it. But he doesn't. In teaching on how to follow, Jesus says in Luke 9, 60, but he said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. And the one that is closest to our understanding of Mark chapter 3 is the third person in Luke 9, 61. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, 
is fit for the kingdom of God. There is a cost for following Jesus. And that cost could be a multitude of things. It could be your sinful lifestyle. It could be the comforts of your life that is comfortable not doing the will of the Father and being obedient to Jesus. It could be relationships. And here, this is what Jesus presents to us as he sees his family coming and he says, who are those people? It is akin to this understanding that we might have to leave behind family. We might have to lose family in order to follow Jesus. And you might say, Pastor, how in the world could I ever do that? What on earth would Jesus need me to do that for? I'm not saying don't ever talk to your family again, but here's what I'm going to tell you is that some of us, we need to recognize that just as difficult as it is to be a Christian in that friend group, just as difficult as it is to be a a Christian with those coworkers, it is just that difficult to go to the family reunion and be a Christian. Because some of you have families, I don't know, but I can bet because I have a family like this, I have a side like this, some of you have families where when you go, you will be tempted with the things of the world. When you visit with them, when you click up with them, when you do the things that they do, you're going to find that they are ungodly things and that you and your house, as Joshua says, for me and my house, what are we going to do? We're going to follow the Lord. We're going to do the right thing. It might cost family. It might cost friends. It might cost comforts of this world in order to follow Jesus. Whatever it costs, he's worthy of following because there is certainly a reward in doing so. And we see that very reward in Matthew. This is the only times we're flipping this morning. I don't typically do this on a Sunday morning, but it's important for our understanding here. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, and I just want to read one verse in verse 29. Matthew 19 29. Here Peter asks Jesus a question. He says, hey, what's our reward going to be for following you? And Jesus answers the question and he opens it up even broader than just Peter, just his apostles and his disciples. And in Matthew 19, 29, Jesus lays it all out there for anyone who would suffer or cost or have loss for his namesake. Matthew 19, 29, this is the words of Jesus yet again. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my namesake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. The reward Even though there's a cost for following Jesus, even though it means sometimes severing the relationships of this world, the cost is great, but the reward is so much greater. That whatever you lose, whatever is costed of you, whatever is demanded of you in order to follow Jesus, he will return the reward many times as much. Eternal life is guaranteed to you. And this morning, I wonder, Christian, who is the person that you need to leave behind in order to better follow Jesus. No, that does not mean you leave them, you forget them, you don't pray for them. No, it doesn't mean any of those things. But it does mean a a change, a transformation. Who ought you to leave in order that you can more rightly follow Jesus? This could be something that is very costly, something that's very difficult, but the reward is great. And I I want to give you an example as we move into the next point here of what's happened in my own life. I don't have the greatest relationship with my, my family as I once did. And one of the reasons why is because when I moved away from college, even though it was from Meridian to Hattiesburg and not too far of a place, I began very quickly to get involved with ministry here in Hattiesburg and now in, in Brooklyn. And as that has happened, I've begun to minister and to live alongside the people of God here in this community. And it is quite often that me and Adrian, we marvel at the fact that there's people in this congregation who maybe don't even know me well and know more intimate things about me sometimes than my family even does. 
And that's not to say that my family is bad or, or, or that I've, I've abandoned them because they're in sin, but just to say, look at how close the family of God is, that in many ways, I have brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and grandparents in the faith right here. I mean, we just saw it this morning. There are many people who said, your baby, she's, she's passed here and there and the other. Miss Donna said, your baby's never met a stranger because he or she is just letting me hold her. That's right, because everybody here is Rayleigh's grandparent. Y- y'all know it. You pick her up and you go with her, and we're not going to say a thing to you. Why? Because we're family. Because you're, you're her grandparents. Because you're my spiritual mom and dad. Because you're my spiritual brother and sister. Because you're my spiritual grandparents. That's the closeness of, of this community and of this bond of faith here at First Baptist Church Brooklyn. That is a testimony of my own as an outsider who was not born and bred in... FCHS and South Forest and Brooklyn, Mississippi and all of the things that go on here. I am the furthest thing from a good old boy in Brooklyn. I I ain't never, Miss Debbie does more cows and farming than I do. Okay, amen. Uh, I, I have no idea when it comes to these things. I just like it when you bring me a tomato and I can have a tomato sandwich. I like it when you bring my eggs so I can scramble something from my baby. I don't know nothing about that though. But even though there's such a stark difference between the city boy from Rudy, Mississippi, and the good old boys from Brooklyn, Mississippi, you've welcomed me in. We're family together. The differences fade away because the thing that is the same is the most important. And this is how Jesus goes on after he answers them and says, who aren't my mother and my brothers? He goes on in verse 34, and he recognizes that there are those who are even closer now than his mother and his brothers. Verse 34, looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. Jesus recognizes that those he fellowships with, those he teaches, those he bonds together in the spirit with are closer than his real mother and brother. They are even fit to be called his very mother and brother. They're fit to be called his family. And what happens, church, when we begin as the people who are gathered in this room to recognize ourselves not only as the church, but as family together? For we hold hands and we sing a song at the end of every service, but I don't know if you actually believe it. I don't know if you actually put it into practice. For when we actually begin to recognize each other as the true family of God, this becomes prioritized. I remember as a kid, every Sunday afternoon, you knew where I was going to be. I was going to be at Memaw's table eating some roast beef. It was a priority of our family that we got together and we had dinner with my grandmother every single Sunday. There was not, I, I cannot recall not one Sunday in my 18 years growing up in Meridian, Mississippi, that we skipped Memaw's Sunday dinner. I cannot think of one. If we skipped Sunday dinner because there was a baptism or something like that and Memaw came to our church, we was going to Cracker Barrel afterwards. We were sitting down with them all. That was, that was, that was going to happen. When we begin to recognize that this is family, this becomes priority. Nothing's going to get in the way of us gathering together with our family. This is important. What else is going to happen? When we begin to recognize each other as the family of God, we're going to begin to become united and to really know what it means to bear one another's burdens. You're going to begin to know people in the room in a very intimate way, in a way that is beyond friendship, that is beyond family even. we're, We're going to recognize the sins that we struggle with, and we're going to take that off of one another's backs and place it on another in order that together we might bear and overcome the things of this world. This is what happens when we become family together. We're going to build each other up. We're going to recognize one another's gifts. We're going to be ministered to for the cause of Christ. And it's a difficult thing to recognize, but one thing that's going to happen when we become family together is we're going to begin to replace the family that we've lost. We're going to begin to replace the friends. We're going to begin to replace the coworker. We're going to begin to replace the family member who is estranged because of the sin in their life. This is an important body, and it's important that we prioritize it and we recognize one another. As Jesus recognized those who followed him, we are family. But I also recognize that being family gives us problems too. 
there's not a person in here that has a functional family. We all have dysfunctional families. Amen. Amen. Whether it's immediate or whether it's extended, we all have dysfunctional families to one degree or another. We've got the black sheep of the family or we've got in, in-house problems that we have to deal with. There's not a perfect family. Not even the church is a perfect family. It's going to have problems. Family breeds problems. But here's the difference. When we get in bickering matches in the church and we don't view each other as family, it's over. We walk away and we hate each other and we're angry and we're done with it. But when we're family and we're in the church and the bickering happens, as it will, because we're family, what do you do with family? You're going to have to look at them at Thanksgiving. You're going to have to look at them at Christmas. You're going to have to get over it because you're family and family gets together and family loves each other. This is what happens in the church of God. When we recognize each other as family, even in the midst of problems, we're going to get over it. Here's what's going to happen, and here's something I've had a vision for for so long. I just don't know how to accomplish it. Maybe you can help me. Here's what happens when we become family. How many people have been a part of this family of God that is First Baptist Church Brooklyn and have walked out the doors never to come back again? How many people who, if I gave you our membership roles and you flipped through them real quick and you looked, would you recognize as people who used to come here and don't anymore? It should not be so that there are so many people who know this church and have been touched by this church and are a part of this church in some season of their life, and now they have nothing to do with it. For family does not let family walk away and go about and do their own thing and be in sin in the world, and no one ever call and check on them, and no one ever invite them back, and no one ever say, brother or sister, you're in sin and you need to get back in church. But here's the problem, church is the 28-year-old pastor from Meridian, Mississippi don't know those people because they were from before my time. I, I, I don't know everybody in the community. And more than that, they don't know me. But you know the people who were here before. You know the people in the community who used to be in church and now are captive by Satan. When we're family and when we begin to recognize this body of believers as family, we go and we leave the 99 after the one. We go and we, we say, what, what's going on? I've been praying for you. I've been thinking of you. Uh, let me give you a call. Let me, let me go and, and minister to you. Let me go and invite you back to church. Let me go and call you back to the baptism and the salvation that we witnessed at First Baptist Church. And let me know that the good work that has begun in you, Christ is going to fulfill it. This is what we do when we're family. When you view this church as family, when we begin to recognize the unity that's in this congregation, when we begin to look at it the way Jesus does, our perspective is going to change. And this and these people are going to become incredibly important. So, how do you enter this family? Maybe there's someone here this morning who all that I've said up to this point, they didn't really, that, that didn't jive with them. For they maybe recognize there's somebody they need to get away from, but, but there's, there's not a whole lot that they understand about being part of a church for maybe they've never been a part of a church. I don't know. I don't know your backstory. You and the Lord do. But this morning, Jesus ends Mark chapter 3 by telling someone how they enter into the family of God. This morning, maybe you need to be reminded of this, or maybe for the first time you need to hear this. This is what Jesus says in verse 35. For whoever does the will of God... He is my brother and my sister and my mother. Jesus demands obedience. He says, if you want to be a part of what's going on in my church, if you want to be my family, if you want to be a part of First Baptist Church Brooklyn, you've got to be obedient. Now, this might sound like something that you can do. You might say, this is easy. Be obedient to God. But I want to remind you of some other words of Jesus where he says, be perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus asks for obedience. Let me tell you, obedience is difficult. Obedience is hard. Every single one of us has been disobedient. Every single one of us has sinned. But this is the good news of Jesus, that while he demands obedience and we have fallen so short, God sent Jesus Christ, his son, into the world to live the perfect life that we cannot. 
And he lived that perfect life where we had fallen. And still he went to the sinner's cross and took on the penalty for my sins and for your sins. Through our imperfection, he was punished even in his perfection. And he did this in order that you might be saved, that you might be grafted into this family of God. And he rose up from the grave three days later in his resurrection in order that you might not live in this family of God free from your sins in this life only, but for eternity you might be his son or his daughter. This is what Jesus Christ has done. This is how you enter into the family of God. And this morning, I want you to know that Jesus welcomes all into his family. It doesn't matter how great your sin is. It doesn't matter how small your sin is. It doesn't matter how numerous your sin is. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter what you're doing in the presence. For repentance is called of everyone who would enter into this family of God. And he calls that you would leave your sins behind. No matter how great they are. For Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, such were some of you. Every person in this room was once a sinner far from God. But praise God, we have left behind our old ways, and now we walk in the newness of Jesus Christ. A newness in obedience and righteousness in His grace and His love. Maybe this morning, for the very first time, you need to commit to Him as the Lord and Savior of your life. Maybe you need to recognize that you are not a part of His family, but you want to be. And maybe this morning, You need to commit in another way. Maybe you're someone here this morning who has been a part of a church before, who does know Jesus Christ, but you're not involved in this family. Maybe this morning you need to join this church. Maybe you need to rededicate your life and commit to him once again. Maybe you just need to come to this altar and pray and say to the Lord and not to anybody else that I am a sinner and I want to come back to your house, Lord. Direct my paths that I might do well and right by your will. And obedience to you. This morning, whatever your decision is, I'm going to invite you to come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning and this gathering where we as the people of God can reflect on what you've done for us. And Lord, now during this time of decision, I pray that you would move in the hearts of your people, that you would call each of us to repentance right where we are. Lord, I pray this morning, if there's anyone here who does not know you, that this morning, they might be welcomed into your kingdom of God. Lord, help them to repent of the sins that they have in their life and to call upon the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus they might be saved. Lord, we thank you for this time together. And during this time of decision, we ask that you'd be here in our midst. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.